In this video, we'll talk about a classic theory in social network analysis. This theory is the strength of weak ties. It was proposed by the sociologist Mark Granovetta in his 1973 paper. Imagine you work on a research study of how two local communities mobilized against the threat of urban development. Community A has a very dense interconnected social network. Everyone seems to know each other very well. Those are strong ties. People communicate with one another frequently. The tie strength represents strong emotional attachment. Overall, it is a close-knit community. Community B, on the other hand, has some weak ties. Some people don't know each other very well. Some people don't have much in common. Here is the question. Which community is better at mobilizing the community resources? Here is another example. Imagine you are looking for a job. Your close friends should be very helpful. They are more likely to share job opening information than those who you know only by name. After all, your close friends care more about you than your acquaintances do. Your close friends are your strong ties and your acquaintances are your weak ties. This was what Granovetta's research study was about. He wanted to know how people got jobs. Granovetta used a random sample of professionals, technical workers, and managers on the job market in the Boston suburb. He asked them who found the new job through contacts and how often they saw the contacts around the time that they were passed on job information. Please note here, Granovetta differentiated the tie strength by the frequency of contact. Often means at least twice a week. Occasionally means less than twice a week, but more than once a year. Rarely means once a year or less. The assumption was that your close friends whom you had frequent contact would be more motivated to pass on job information to you than those who you contacted less often. This assumption was not supported by the results. It was not your friend. It was just an acquaintance. More than half of the job changers found the job with the job information they got from occasional contacts. The percentage of job changers getting the job information from strong ties was 16.7%, even lower than the percentage of getting information from whom they contacted once a year or less. Granovetta's results on job search were very counterintuitive. The value of your close friends in job search is very limited. Why? Because they know many of the same people you do. And they are often exposed to similar information as you do. Your close friends are unlikely the ones who can help you get into a new environment, no matter how much they care about you. Instead, it is usually your weak ties, your acquaintances, who are the useful ones because they can give you information you would never otherwise have received. How to identify weak ties? You can do it by looking at the network structure at a group level. You can observe the structure in which the individuals are embedded. The strength of weak ties lies with the fact that weak ties bring in new information and new ideas. When it comes to finding a job, getting news, or spreading a new idea, our weak ties are more important than our strong ties. Our acquaintances are more important than our close friends. Often, your close friends are in touch with one another. Your close friends move in the same social circles as you do. They are likely to be exposed to the same information as you do. Those connections are reflected in a densely connected social network. 
but each of your acquaintances is likely to have close friends in his or her own right, and can bring in the information and resources you don't get from your close friends. To get new information, you have to activate your weak ties. The weak ties or your acquaintances are your bridges to the outside world. Your strong ties, on the other hand, can create an echo chamber, trapping you in a comfortable bubble. Without weak ties, your close friends reinforce your pre-existing beliefs, and you are less likely to be challenged with new ideas. Over time, you become more and more resistant to new ideas. Many close-knit communities and organizations have this problem. Strong ties nurture strong trust in each other, but strong ties also make people resistant and even hostile toward new ideas. Granovetta's strength of weak tie theory is different from Erdash and Rennie's random network theory. We introduced the random network theory in an earlier video. You can find the video link in the description section below. In a random network, there would be no circle of friends, as our ties to other nodes are completely random. According to the random network theory, the probability of your two closest friends knowing each other is the same as the probability that your neighborhood bakery owner's best friend is an African tribal chief. But this is not what our society looks like. In most cases, your good friends know each other's friends. They often go to the same parties, frequent the same bakeries, and watch the same movies. The stronger the tie between two people, the larger the overlap between their circles of friends. Why is the theory of the strength of weak ties so special in network analysis? Before the proposal of this theory, there were two strands of techniques for network analysis. The first strand focuses on the relationship between network structure and node attributes. Researchers investigate the tie connecting the members of a population, like a company, a school, or a political organization. Researchers also look into node attributes that describe preferences and characteristics of the nodes. If the nodes are people in an organization, the node attributes can be gender, age, ethnicity, education level, and years of experience. In this strand of social network analysis, the developed techniques include multi-dimensional scaling and hierarchical clustering. Those techniques were developed with the assumption that the node attributes, such as people's preferences and characteristics, explain the pattern of the ties in the networks. This is the group level of network analysis. The second strand of techniques were developed based on two assumptions. The first assumption is that network is a conduit for information flow or influence. The second assumption is where a node is located in the network determines what information that node has access to, and the structural location in the network could give the node a position of influence. With these two assumptions, researchers developed a large group of centrality measures to quantify nodes' network positions. Those centrality measures include, but not limited to, degree centrality, betweenness centrality, closeness centrality, and eigenvector centrality. After calculating those centrality measures, researchers can then correlate the centrality measures with other observable differences in individual performance. In leadership research, we can identify if leaders of an organization occupy the central position in the networks. We can also correlate each individual's centrality with their colleagues' rating of their work performance, 
This is the node level of network analysis. The strength of weak ties theory connects the node level analysis and group level analysis. Weak ties are created by individuals, but their presence influences the status and the performance not just of the individuals with the weak ties, but of the entire group to which they belong. One merit of the strength of weak tie theory is that the theory builds a bridge between the micro level interactions and macro level patterns of networks. According to this theory, the individual interactions at the node level can be translated into large scale patterns at the network level, and they in turn feed back into the micro level interactions at the node level. What are the implications of the theory of strength of weak ties? First, strong and weak ties are not in binary dichotomy. Tie strength is a continuum. Not all weak ties are equally weak. Tie strength is not static either. Some weak ties will become strong ties over time, and some strong ties will become weak ties. Another important implication of the strength of weak ties lies with diversity and groupthink. Groupthink is a psychological phenomenon in which people strive for consensus within a group. In social networks without weak ties, people tend to set aside their own personal beliefs and adopt the opinion of the rest of the group. People who are opposed to the group decisions tend to remain quiet, preferring to keep the peace rather than disrupting the uniformity of the crowd. Groupthink is prevalent in social networks that are dominated by strong ties. Groupthink can also be reduced by situational factors that contribute to deferring to the group, such as external threats and moral values. The benefit of groupthink is that it allows the group to make decisions efficiently, but the danger is that groupthink undermines diverse views and the quality of group decision making. This is because groupthink tend to suppress dissenting opinions and creative thinking. How do you know groupthink is present? The symptoms of groupthink include first, overconfident. Group members are overconfident and overoptimistic. The group decision is more risk-seeking than the average of individual decision making. The second symptom of groupthink is collective rationalization. Group members rationalize and explain away dissenting views. The third symptom of groupthink is self-censorship. Group members who may have doubts hide their fears due to conformity effect. The fourth symptom of groupthink is suppressing dissenting views. Group leaders label the team members who disagree as being disloyal, not committed to the group interest, or traitors. The fifth symptom of groupthink is illusions of unanimity. Group members believe that everyone is in an agreement and everyone feels the same way. Unanimity does not come from the merits of the ideas, but come from the conformity effect and the suppression of dissenting views. The sixth symptom of groupthink is being close-minded to outgroups. Group members tend to stereotype and even demonize people from outgroups because outgroup members tend to hold different views and beliefs. How to overcome groupthink? One way is to proactively build weak ties. How to build weak ties? Invite members with different backgrounds and views. Invite outsiders. Encourage group members to challenge each other's views and ideas rather than suppressing them. In group decision making, 
leaders should avoid stating their individual preferences and expectations at the outset. Leaders' role in group decision making is not to make decisions, but to set up decision making rules and procedures so that the group can make a quality decision collectively. Another implication of the theory of strength of weak ties is about trust in a team leader. Imagine you are the team leader. Your team has ten members, and you only have time and energy to work with three people on a daily basis, such as node one, two, three. They then primarily work with the rest of the team, which consists of node four to ten. Whether your team members trust you depends heavily on whether the intermediary contacts, which are node one, two, three, because they work with you every day. They know whether you are trustworthy or not, whether you talk the talk and walk the walk, whether you keep your promises, and whether you take other people's credit. If you don't have ties between you and node four to ten. There is no way for node four to ten to make a direct judgment about how trustworthy you are. Their only information source is from the intermediary contacts, which are node one to three. So your team's trust in you depends on the motives of node one to three. Moreover, since you don't have ties, not even weak ties, to node four to ten, you may have little motivation to be responsive or even trustworthy to node four to ten. If a school district superintendent tells everyone that he or she works for the interest of all students, the first question you ask is. When was the last time you spent the entire day with the students? Not a ten-minute photo op or shaking hands, but heart-to-heart -heart conversations. Due to organizational hierarchy and the nature of top leaders' work, they are usually removed from what's really going on in a team or an organization. Without weak ties, it is very difficult for those frontline workers, such as Node Four to Ten, in your organization, to have trust in you. Here are some background stories about the publication of the strength of weak ties theory. As a doctoral student, Granovetta completed the paper that proposed the theory in 1969 and mailed it to the American Sociological Review in August. The paper went into the journal's double-blinded peer review system. Four months later, Granovetta received a rejection letter from the journal. It was a rejection. Not even revise and resubmit. In the rejection letter, one of the reviewers wrote, "The paper strikes me as trivial and as an addition in the endless series of threats beyond unsettled frontiers." Granovetta stated in his paper, "Extensive enough weak ties can knit together large numbers of people and make organization possible." The reviewer responded, "I may be wrong, but my reaction is, of course they can and do knit together." The reviewer concluded, "If I have taken the liberty of extensive criticism." It's because the paper is at least provocative. This is what author himself hopes for his paper, but it is not enough. The second peer reviewer asked, "One wonders just what it is that the author is writing about. It must have been very discouraging to read those comments as a doctoral student." Granovetta did not touch the paper until three years later. In 1972, he submitted a shortened version of the manuscript to a different journal, the American Journal of Sociology. 
The paper was finally published in this journal in May 1973, four years after its first submission. This paper of the strength of weak ties has been recognized as one of the most influential sociology papers ever written. As of January 2021, this paper was cited almost 60,000 times, according to Google Scholar. If citations are not a good indicator of the influence of an academic paper, then being on the short list of Nobel Prize winners can be a better indicator. In 2014, Gran Nevada was on the list of predicted Nobel Prize winners in economics. He did not win the Nobel Prize that year, but that's not the point. The lesson we can learn from this story is that the next time you feel discouraged when you read rejection letter from a journal, you come back and read the scathing comments in Granovetta's rejection letter of a paper that later became one of the most cited sociology papers. Hope Granovetta's rejection letter can offer a ray of hope for all researchers.